This episode of The Her Show is brought to you by Knack Bags, the best backpacks for working from anywhere. From the Empty the Bench Podcast Network, straight out of New York City, it's time for The Her Show. He's back and better than ever. And on today's show, from Nick Arcade, Phil Moore. With your host, Kyle Hershon. And now, here's Hersh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hersh Show. So excited to have you all here. Hope you had a great weekend. April's coming up this week. I mean, we're getting ready for springtime. And speaking of springtime, my guest has, you know, got the energy of a spring bouncing in the morning. He's from Los Angeles right now. Please welcome Mr. <laughs> Phil Moore, Nick Arcade. Hey, what's up, Kyle? <laughs> spring has sprung, man. It's time to get it done. And by the way, everybody, that's a real background back there. It's not a green screen. Wink, wink. <laughs> oh, I mean... Watch that arm, man. Don't knock that brick over. Watch it on that brick. Yeah, Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, Phil, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, So uh, we've been actually talking the last couple of weeks and, you know, just, you know, wondering what's going on and everything. So tell me, uh, you're in L.A. now. What are you uh, working on this point? I I think I think I know what you're working on, but just a collaborate. uh, Elaborate. Let me know. Elaborate on it. I, I, you want to collaborate? Well, what do you I think? I love to about collaborate in the two? future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, I'm I am uh, working on. I'm actually about to finish up the last week, uh, the finale episode of a show called Exposure. Uh, it's on Hulu, and it's like a reality competition show that deals with photographers. This season, we're not just dealing with photography, but we're also dealing with uh, video uh, content creators. So oh, we wow. got, you know, we got people on from TikTok, people on from YouTube, uh, and it's also going to be seen on uh, YouTube uh, season two. So, and, and the finale, we start shooting the finale on. Um, on I think Monday on Monday. Wow. So, um, yeah, so starting Monday, we're going to be winding it down and somebody's going to walk away with a $250,000 grand prize from Samsung. Just because you took your phone and shot some stuff. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Using the Samsung S 22. Did I get that plug in there? I did. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, how, how often do new episodes drop? Uh, uh, well, season one, I think they dropped like, you know, once a week or I don't know if they for season two, they're going to do like, um, uh, most shows and like, you know, do it all at once. So you can binge it. I don't know. Uh, my job right now is, and what I've been doing here for the last few years is it's, it's what I'm called a senior challenge producer. And that's the person who comes up with on these game shows, the games that they do, the stunts that they do, the challenges that are created. You know, I've been doing stuff. I've, I've even been back in Nickelodeon, uh, producing games for, uh, Ryan's mystery play day tuned in, uh, there's a show coming up on NBC called uh, The Wheel. The Wheel. Uh, oh this, my this, God! Yes. <laughs> the, the, the British show is done in America, and, and and I was a part of that that absolutely crazy ride. The Wheel. That's uh, so we cool. Have, we actually have Michael, the host of the British one here. The Wheel. Um, I, uh, last uh, over the summer, I was in Hawaii as a challenging game producer for Love Island for CBS. So it's been really nice, man. I've been having a, a, a decent time traveling a little bit. Um, it's interesting for a while, I started doing a little bit of writing and, and doing some behind the scenes stuff. But once I got back to games, which is where it all started for me in Nickelodeon, I realized like, why the heck did I ever leave? This is where I'm supposed <laughs> to be. <make." laughs> so I'm back at, I'm back at creating games. If you wanted to fling fly slime or smush, I'm the guy that's making it up on these shows. <laughs> I, I got to watch uh, above me in case any. <laughs> exactly. Just don't say I don't know. <laughs> you just did. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, speaking of games, I, w- I want to get to where you first started uh, in this world of uh, crazy world of entertainment and television. Um, obviously, you know, you started off as a stand up comic uh, before breaking into this business. You were doing stuff for a little show on MTV called remote control. Oh gosh, remote control. It's funny. Cause I was just hanging out with a couple of guys that were uh, uh, stage managers and worked in production on that show. Yeah. MTV hosted by the late great Ken Ober, uh, co-starred Colin Quinn went on the MTV um, is where I met a- uh, Adam Sandler who, who, who appeared as a character called stick pin. Dennis Leary would pop in every now and then it was like, we were all just trying to like make our way and, you know, get into the business. Um, I jumped on that show because, um, you know, I was living in Florida at the time. I'm from Baltimore. I'm from, wait, 
I'm from Baltimore. There you go, Baltimore. Uh, but but, uh, uh, but uh, I was in Florida, and uh, uh, at the time I was married, and um, being a stand-up comic, you travel a lot, um, but I was about to become a dad, so I wanted to get off the road and be home uh, for my wife and the upcoming baby. So um, uh, while I was doing my stand-up traveling around, I met with some folks in New York at Viacom, um, put in my, just my resume, just said, Hey, if anything comes up and then they reached out to me and said, we're going to be shooting MTV doing spring break down in Florida. And they're trying to, you know, see if they can save one, bringing everybody from New York down. So they're trying to see if there's any locals that they could hire to do the job. So I got a gig there doing audience warm up, which is basically doing your stand up back, except you go home to your house every single night instead of a motel six in the middle of uh, Bent Toenail, Iowa. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really how I got into TV because up until that point, uh, I had just done stand-up. I'd done a couple of specials on uh, a couple of, um, uh, I'd done stand-up on a couple of specials on TV, but it was small cable things. But when I got to get remote control, it was like, okay, great. I can work in my own backyard and still do stand-up. And that's, that's what got me into television. I went from that, uh, and by the way, that was opening, that was shooting at the, the, before opening the, um, the Disney MGM studios, which I now think is called Disney Hollywood or something. Yes. Hollywood, Hollywood studios. Studios, Hollywood studios. Um, but, but it wasn't even open yet. Like the the park wasn't open, but the sound stages were operational. Same with universal studios, universal studios, Orlando, Florida was the same way. The <laughs> sound stages were working. But um, the parks weren't open yet. So uh, when I got done with that, I having worked there for a while, I was able to slide over and do uh, audience warm up for the new Mickey Mouse Club. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of stuff that came in. There was a show called That's My Dog, Team Win, Lose or Draw, um, the finales of um, America's Funniest Home Videos. Uh, just if it came there and it was family friendly um, and he needed a warm up person, that was the thing. Like I have a lot of great friends um, that that I that I start out in the business with, uh, you know, Daryl Hammond, Tom Rhodes, um, Billy Gardell. But my act was always kind of PG anyway. And when you have a studio audience that's comprised of kids or families from from the theme parks, you kind of have to keep it a certain way. And so being the big kid that I am, I just found that that was kind of niche for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I would go to any sort of talk show, I mean, I, I went to my first talk show when I was nine. Uh-huh. Like I, I went to see uh, the great Regis Philbin. Uh, so I got to see him and Kelly Ripa. And actually, no, they didn't have a warm up person. That, I was wrong. Uh, wait, what did I see? Uh, no, it was Wheel of Fortune. I saw okay. them when I was seven years old. Uh-huh. Seven years old in Philadelphia, uh, they were doing a taping, and Charlie O'Donnell, the late great Charlie O'Donnell, was the mm-hmm. warm-up act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, and and then eventually, once I started, you know, doing more because I I am what's called a professional audience member. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got a thing, they got a meme now on, uh, on 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 YouTube and stuff with people who are professional extras in movies who <laughs> <laughs> gain some fame with their over exaggerated expressions, standing behind like you know uh, Toby Maguire going ooh. I'm you're I'm the, the, the audience I, version of that. I am that guy. I mean, I I know when to clap. I know when to cheer, and I know when to go ooh ah and then laugh. <laughs> so it's like, hey, if you ever need, if I'm in Los Angeles and if you need an audience member or something to cut like canned audio or whatever, call me. <laughs> um, so you know, as I'm getting into this sort of thing. The these people, you know, the warm up acts. Uh, I can name me a great one right now. Tom Kelly is a great one. Um, I saw him and met him many times when I was doing a hundred thousand dollar pyramid. I did a uh, Stray and Sarah and Kiki with the you oh, know wow. Good Morning America. Uh-huh. Um, you know, they bring out so much energy out of the crowd when, you know, when there's like, oh, it's like 6 a.m., it's so cold because, of course, I usually go when it's like in the dead of winter where it's so, <laughs> it's so cold in New York city. You don't get those summer. See, when I started doing warm up for MTV, it was during that spring break. You see, mm. I'm a guy. <laughs> <laughs> see, I usually go because to me, not many people would go out into, uh, into You're the crowd. You're to get in. No long lines. Nobody wants to stand outside in the cold to get in the line. The line is real short. You're standing in the queue inside, aren't you? There you go. Exactly. And that, <laughs> that's how I ended up getting pictures with Ryan Seacrest, uh, Kiki Palmer, you know, it, 
getting in early has its privileges. All right. You know what? I, I, I take what I've said back. You are a thinking man too. (laughs) (laughs) I do it all for the clout. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, about remote control. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, you did a lot of stuff with them and Mm -hmm. of course the great Ken over. So uh, you ended up taking your spiel and Somehow, somebody saw that at Nickelodeon, and I was warned by Jeff Sutphin a couple of weeks ah. ago. <laughs> I was warned by Jeff Sutphin a couple of uh, weeks ago. If I mention the words Orlando, Florida, we're going to have a good time. And whatever you do, don't bring up Orlando, Florida, or you need to clear three days of your time. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you something. Like, Florida gets a bad rap, and I'm not saying that some of it isn't deserved, but I'm one of these cats where no matter what it is that's just going on and the craziness is happening, I will always say Orlando was good to me. I got mm-hmm. nothing bad to say. I got nothing bad to say about Orlando. <laughs> the craziest, most what the hell thing can happen there. And I go, but Orlando was good to me. Uh, yeah, it was. I, well, here's what happened. I uh, was doing this audience warm up stuff. One of the other shows that I did audience warm up for was Let's Make a Deal. Um, mm. They brought in Bob Hilton, and then for a while they brought back the original king of Let's Make a Deal, Monty, Monty Hall. Hall. I was doing the audience warm up for it, and it was a Dick Clark production. Now, Mr. Clark was always there, but you know, I'm like low man on a totem pole. I'd never seen him. We had done, I don't know how many episodes, week after week after week but I'd never, ever seen a man. So, you know, let's make a deal. They have Zonks, you know, like yes. the movie prizes. And on one episode, um, I, the stage manager calls me over. I had done all my bits. Like, you know, you have to get a routine in mind, you know, yes. uh, when you're doing audience warm up. It's now the big deal. All we're about to do is like, you know, go to the end of the show. So as you do your bits, you're pacing it knowing the big deal segment only. Like I, I do a little bit of warm up. Then the big deal is all about what's going on. I don't speak at all. And then when it's over with, thank you folks. Good night. So I did all my bit. And then the stage manager calls me over and says, Hey, Phil, while we were setting up for the big deal back there, uh, the last song we had, yeah, that elephant took a dump on the stage floor. No. <laughs> so, so, no. so we need you to stretch while we clean up the elephant feces in the back. I was like, and I looked at him and I just went, I've done all my bits. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, no. So now I'm like scrambling. And so what ended up doing, and this was the, this was, I think was that next level. This is why when people talk about, uh, uh, I, I try to tell people, I've told my son, I've told my, my, my stepdaughter is not like, um, when you, when you, when you are finding yourself up against something that would seem like an adversity, like really look at what it is you're learning through this. Because uh, on the other side of me almost wanting to panic that I've done all my bits and I've got to stretch was the I had to do something. So I started improving with the audience. And now I've improv with people before and audiences before, but it's always like if you're doing stand up five minutes of your bit, then get back to your, your act. Then maybe five minutes over here, then get back to your act. I had to stretch for who knew how long. And it was all improv. And so that was a moment that should have been a panic moment for me, but I jumped right into it and somehow um, just improv with the audience, had them laughing, had them applauding. What I did with them was was almost better than the regular shtick that I would do. And, <laughs> and from that moment, that's when I got this new level of competence and started working more and more on this skill of improvisational, but it all, but it originally came back from what looked like an adversity for me. You know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, so here's what I do. After we do it, um, the guy, the stage manager comes over and goes, okay, Phil, Hey, listen, we're all set. Uh, but before you uh, tell everybody we're getting back to the show, uh, Dick Clark is standing here in the wings. He wants to say something to the crowd. So this is my first time meeting him. So I can't fanboy out, you know, no. I have to stand- Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Da, 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 da. But before we get going, this show, as you may have known, may or not know, is produced by Dick Clark Productions and the legend himself is here. And you'd like to say something to you right now, please put your hands together. Welcome, Mr. Dick Clark. This yeah. is my first time meeting the man. Dick Clark comes out, 
audience gives them a standing ovation. You do that thing you're supposed to do. You step away. You put the mic behind your back. You let the spotlight stay on the man. Then when Mm -hmm. he's absorbed enough, he walks over to me. I hand him the mic to walk away. He grabs my wrist and goes, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, before before we get started, uh, most of the time when something like this happens, we in the control room are panicking. But I've never had as much fun in a crisis situation as I had watching this young man, please give it up for Fillmore. I was like, <laughs> he knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> knows my name. That's that and special. This is, this is, this is, this is the, the, the hand of God truth. When I went home that day, I called my agent at, cause I was always happy just doing warm up and stand up. That's it. Stand up comedy. I mm-hmm. called my agent and I literally told her the whole story. I just told you, I said, I want my own show. She goes, oh, let me just call the show fairy. What do you mean you want your own show? (laughs) I said, start sending me out on auditions for TV shows. I had always been the one where every time they would call me and go, we have a movie shooting here. We have a show that's shooting here. I'm like, I don't mention that. I just want to be a great stand-up. But I went home and I called her and I said, I want my own show. And from there that she started sending me out on auditions. And, And the rest is just typical audition stuff. She sent right. me out on an audition for Nickelodeon. That's how they found out about me. And, and I think the thing that kind of made them go, okay, we'll check this guy out is because I'd already done what they consider decent work for them on their show remote control. Cause Nickelodeon and MTV are all Viacom. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's all one big happy family. So somebody around Viacom knew who I was, somebody who was associated with Nickelodeon. So there you go. Rest there of you go. History. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, despite, you know, only being on for a couple of years, Nick Arcade really just gathered this cult following. I mean, you've done Comic Cons, you've done appearances with the game itself. I think you even tried at one point to bring it back for yeah. a modern age. And, yeah. and what, what was so cool about Nick Arcade was the, at the time, the, technological advancements the video zone was the biggest thing and you had all these popular games i had a friend ask me before we came on today if you saw i I think it was the beta version of sonic quest 2 or something or i can't remember Uh what it was (laughs) we we had sonic 2 on and in in its beta testing phase before it was uh available to the public um they came to us and asked will we put it on the show and not only was it sort of like yeah we're promoting it we also got to uh help them work out the kinks of it so nick arcade actually premiered sonic 2 before it was even available uh to the public for purchase there's a bit of trivia for you folks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean and not only that i mean you had like different uh Interesting people on the show. I mean, you had at the time before NSYNC came around, you had Joy Fatone as a contestant. Joy Fatone, <laughs> and, and we, we got together and, and, and worked together on, a, on another another project too. Uh, it was one of those, you pick up the phone, you say, hey, but let me just say something I want to, before you go on, yeah. uh, about, about how Nickelodeon has endured now. We just, this year, uh, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of Nick Arcade's premiere. Wow. And, and, and I always, I got to get, put on my serious face for a second. Hang on, hang on. Yeah. This is my serious face right here. Uh, <laughs> because I seriously mean this. Uh, it is 100%. I cannot, I'm overwhelmed by the fans that like the show. Uh, because um, some more behind the scenes trivia, Nick Arcade really didn't get the sort of same level of marketing that a lot of the other shows did. Mm-hmm. Um, to this day, I keep telling, well, I, well, I take that back. But Nick Ar- for a while, up until maybe last year, up until last year, you could not buy any merch that had Nick Arcade on it. I think they now have a deal with some other com- some other T-shirt company or something that now. But you have to think about it. Like, and during all of the '90s and the early 2000s and the 2010s, like you could not buy any merchandise of any kind that said Nick Arcade. If you had Nick Arcade merch, you either made it yourself or you worked at Nickelodeon and you took some swag home. Um, we would go out on tour. We, Michael Malley and I did the Nick live tour and uh, you yes. could go to the, you could go to the concession stands and buy guts thingy. You could buy double dare stuff, rug rats, Ariel monsters. You could buy roundhouse stuff. Most people don't even remember that cool <laughs> show, but you could not buy Nick Arcade stuff. Um, Mark Summers and I actually had a, we were at a, a gaming expo and he, he was having fun with me going, Hey, look, 
Double Dare has a video game, but the TV show about video games <laughs> doesn't have a video game. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. Rugrats had a video game. Guts had a video game. Um, we got no, we got such little marketing. Uh, as a matter of fact, for one of the cons that I was doing, they were trying to, they were asking me to send them, you know, still pictures of, you know, press pictures from the show. And I said, you can't find any because they were never taken. They went, no, this was a TV show. It's the normal press thing you do. I said, I know. Yeah. There's pictures of Mike and Mo doing like this. There's yeah. pictures of Kirk Fogg with OMAC in the background. There's pictures of Summer Sanders with Billy the Answer Head. There's pictures of everybody. And then, you know, Mark Summers and Robin and Harvey, but oh, there's yeah. not one single picture of me not moving. Anything that you've ever seen, even if it's professionally put out there, is a screen grab because they never even did a photo day. Like, and so when I stop and I go, this is a show that should have disappeared, sort of. This is a show yeah. that sort of like had its run, had its good time and gone away. <clears throat> but when I think of like some of the Nickelodeon great hit shows, especially great hit game shows, I mean, I think of Legends. I think of, of, of Double Dare, the, the king of the mountain. Yeah. And speaking of mountain, there's gut. But the fact that like Nick Arcade is still right there and, and spoken of in, in that same group of folks, along with uh, Figure It Out, um, amazes me. And I can only say it has nothing to do with me. And it really has nothing to do with how Nickelodeon marketed the show. It is 100% uh, because of the fans. And that's why I always say it. I'm not joking. 90s Nick fans are the best fans hands down. I don't care if you're a sports fan. I don't care if you're a movie fan. 90s Nick fans, there's something about them that's like unique and is really dope. Uh, absolutely. I mean, so thank pay, you all. Pay, pay attention, Nickelodeon. <laughs> oh, did I say something? <laughs> I mean, there, there's just something that always fascinated me about these shows. I mean, I was very fortunate enough to meet Mark, uh, of course, Jeff Sutphin. Um, mm. And, you know, I got to know what their experiences were like. And of course, mm -hmm. I wasn't really around for the original runs of it all, but of course with, you know, Nick gas, uh, you know, getting me exposed to these shows, I have a much mm -hmm. deeper appreciation for the fact that, you know, there are people out there that have the passion to show this much love to a show. I mean, it really deserved a kid's choice award. Or at really, least two. Uh, you know, it really did. Oh man. Wait, look at you. We got the orange blimp there. Um, I wish this yeah, was real. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's interesting too, like speak, speaking of Jeff, um, see Jeff uh, was what I call next generation Nick. Like we were, you know, Mark, when I think of like the, the original five game show people, it, it's Mark, it's Mike, it's, it's Summer, it's Kirk and myself. That was from like all of the 90s. Then the 2000s started and then Jeff came along, Pick Boy, he did the Figure It Out reboot. Uh, and so I remember when I first ran into him, it was kind of like, Hey, here's the new guy. And, and, and so <laughs> my first meeting him was like, he was doing an entire, no, he was doing brain surge. That's what he was yes. doing. He was doing brain surge. And I was like, Nickelodeon is doing game shows again. I got to meet this guy, you know, that they, that they, they pick to, to now usher in the next wave of Nickelodeon game shows. And so that's how he and I met. And I'm sure he probably told you that um, when I mentioned Ryan's mystery play date, um, yep. that's the show that we currently worked on, which, Again, it's interesting. Um, people will talk about old Nickelodeon versus well, classic Nickelodeon versus Nickelodeon now. Yes. And I'm beginning to see sort of a, 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 a blending of old school and new school because they're getting a lot of us back who not just because like old nostalgia, not just that, you know, we're not doing fan service. It was like we're still doing this. Like I got back into doing game shows because game shows is what I love. And I know the brand Nickelodeon, it makes sense. To, so I'm still doing game shows. It's not like just nostalgia junk, you know, yeah. it's not like, you know, it's not, I'm not, I'm not an Easter egg, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, and, and then the same with Jeff. I mean, like, I mean, you, 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 if you see Jeff with his kids, you might as well be filming a game show while he's out there running around with his kids. Who better to be in charge of, you know, running a, a, a game show on Nickelodeon. Um, the, the guy um, uh, who created, all, co-created all that, and Keenan and Kel, and, uh, he's now the president of Nickelodeon. And of course, Keenan and Kel are uh, co-executive producers of the All That reboot. 
because they're still doing it. They're still, you know, all that was kid SNL. Keenan Thompson's on SNL. Who better to be an executive producer of the reboot of all that than him? You know, it's like, it's, it's, just, it's, it's organic, man. It's organic. And it's really cool that we're all kind of dipping our toe back into that pool. And of course, Mark Summers coming back for the Double Dare reboot. Oh with, my God, with, that was with so Eliza much Koshy. fun. Man, that, you know? That that was so much fun. Uh, watching that show come back, because I would met him the, a year prior to them coming back mm-hmm. on the air, and it, it just seemed that Mark was having the time of his life. And Man. Liza, she, yeah. is, she is a little... A bit of force. She is <laughs> absolutely incredible. And I would honestly say if they decide to do uh, a reboot of Nick Arcade, I mean, obviously you'd be my number one pick to host it, but she could do it as well. She oh, would... yeah. Oh, yeah. She, if, 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 if you took a Duracell battery and said, I would like to make that a person. It's Eliza Kush. It's there Eliza Kush. Eliza Kush, that's it. I mean, she's yeah. like, and that's what I meant by like the old school and the new school coming together. I mean, you know, she's, 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 you know, a, a star in her own right uh, with respect to being a content creator. And, and Mark is a, is a, is an OG uh, uh, you know, legend in the world of game shows. You put those two together. How is it? How is this a bad plan? Exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, now, you know, speaking of the, you know, the the transition from a content creator to being on television i mean we're seeing that now so many times different uh whether it's through a video game streamer or even somebody doing like tech reviews or something like that Mm -hmm. you're seeing all these people that are influencing people to do things that they feel like, oh, maybe I should start doing this. Maybe I should get involved with science, STEM, mm-hmm. or even entertainment. Or, you know, mm-hmm. there there are, I, I think the world of entertainment, I I, I think we're going to be fine once we're all yeah. gone. I think we're yeah, all yeah. going to be fine. Yeah, well, uh, well, and his, yeah, you know, I look at it, I look at it now, and I never, until, until the world of content creating, you know, became a thing, uh, I was like, you like wondering, man, oh man, entertainment, what's going on, what's happening with it. But now you're watching these people and they're doing these, these content creators, these people that are doing things like you and the stuff on, on TikTok and, and, and whatever, the, YouTube, whatever. They, what they're doing is, it reminds me, if I can go old school for you here, yeah. of what happened like with some people with music. Like, you know, you had your James Brown. Okay? Yes. And then a young cat from Minneapolis named Prince sees James Brown and said, well, I'm not just going to imitate you, but I'm going to take something that you did and I'm going to take my own originality stuff. And somehow you can see 100% completely original stuff from Prince, but then you also see the flavor and the influence that James Brown had. And this is what I'm seeing. You see, you see that with rappers where they, where they will take a song that for me, I'm stopping and going, Oh, that's such and such by the so-and-so in 1979. And they're going, no, no, no. It's a new one dropped by this new rapper in 2022, you know? And, and that's what I'm seeing now is happening in the world with content creators. Somehow they are dipping in their toe into some things that they saw that's, that I would call old school or like my generation, but then they're putting their whole unique, like there's some, I'm in the midst of it right now. And the show that I am currently producing exposure season two, it's all about content creators. I come up with a challenge and in the office, we're thinking about like how we envision it would be and where things we're hoping to see that, that they, they would do. And they always, these contestants always exceed everything we were hoping we would end up seeing in the end result. We think, well, hopefully they'll come up with an idea that maybe like this, like this, like this, because that would be entertaining to see. And they come over and go, yeah, how about this? Pow! And that's what contract creators are doing today, man. I'm, I'm blown away and I'm happy for them. Man. Look, I'm not trying to do what they do. I'm trying to do my thing. I'm just happy that, um, like you said, it seems like entertainment is in good hands now. <laughs> I, I believe so. Yeah. All right. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor, Knack. But when we come back, we're going to talk more about the life and career of Mr. Phil Moore and a show that uh, I thought was very interesting that should get more attention than it, sh- that it really did. Uh, a little I thing called... I think uh, you're on to something. <laughs> I think I'm on to something. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. You're on to something. <laughs> hey, everyone. It's Hirsch. I want to take a few moments of your time to talk about today's sponsor, Knack. 
If you're like me, I'm constantly on the move, whether it's for business, leisure, or any sort of thing. And because of that, I need to carry my electronics with me. I have a laptop, I have a tablet, I've got, of course I've got my cell phone, but I wanna tell you about our sponsor, Knack. They have created this beautifully designed bag. I know what's really cool about these is that there's no need to choose between style and functionality. These bags are designed for professionals in mind with function, convenience. It doesn't make you look like a student, so that's that's really nice. With this patented design, Knack is the first backpack that expands. I mean, look at this. I mean, there's so much room in here that you could put anything in here. And it's got a professional appearance to help you look your best, whether you're in the office or you're out in the world. Get a Knack bag today and stop worrying about, you know, the life essentials and stuff, making sure that everything you carry is safe. And if you go to knackbags.com and enter the promo code HIRSCH for a limited time, you will get a free gift. This TSA approved lock. Just add the TSA lock to your cart with your bag of purchase. I mean, I got this beautiful olive green. They come in black, they come in blue, tan, gray. So many amazing colors to choose from. Again, go to the website, knackbags.com, enter the promo code HIRSCH, and you will get a free TSA approved lock. And now, back to our show. All right, welcome back to the Hearst Show. Phil Moore is with me I went today. Pee. <laughs> <laughs> we had a drink, man. I had to go. I'm we drinking did. water. What do, I, what do you want? I mean, you, you're not wrong. I'm honest, expecting... man. I'm you... honest with the people. Nothing and that's, else. And that's what I love about you. And by the way, this is nothing to you. Yeah, people, people, we used to make a mistake when they meet me in person and go, oh, he acts like that because he's on TV. No, 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 no. I was on TV because I act like this. This, right. is, this is stuff that got me like, you know, in trouble in school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, we before we were going to the break, we we were talking about this uh, this show that aired on Nickelodeon uh, in the late '90s uh, called "You're On," which essentially was like a kids' version of Candid Camera. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I I thought you know you you know you see all these kids doing all these challenges, and it's like, okay, why don't we try this? Why don't we mm -hmm. try taking a well-known format that's been around for many, many years? Let's see what the kids can do. Tell me about Euron. Well, the thing about Euron, it's funny, because now I think about, what is that show with the guys um, where, oh man. Uh, oh, was it What Would You Do? No, 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 it's on, it's on True TV, where the guys are like telling somebody what to do. Uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, Impractical Jokers. Impractical Jokers. Impractical Jokers is like a grown up version of You're On. To right. Me when I look at that <laughs> show, uh, because what you have is you have somebody there, they're being fed stuff that they have to say and do, and then they're trying to do it with people who don't know that they're being filmed on TV. Um, mm -hmm. But You're On. So, so here's the thing about You're On. It's, it's, you're on is one of those interesting things too. Like you said, yeah, people normally don't talk about it. Uh, people know, may, know me mainly for Nick Arcade. And as much as I, I, I love, love, love Nick Arcade, I'm grateful for everything about it. And as I, as I already told you, like I bow to the fans, you know, but when I started Nick Arcade, I'd never done TV before. Mm -hmm. um, so when you hear me mispronounce something, um, even the singing of the songs, part of that was like, out of just nervousness. I'm always singing anyway. So to give my brain time to like process whatever it is I would do, uh, I, I would, it was, it gave me a moment to sort of like pause, but still keep something being heard and said, you know, uh, I was nervous. It was my first time doing anything. And, and I was kind of green to the, to television, not show business, but television. By the time I got the year on, which was 1999, I was at like a 10 year season veteran. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I knew I'd done so many things. I'd done other shows. I'd done tours. I'd done so much stuff now that being in front of the camera was like second nature to me. And so I had personally so much fun doing that show because the nerves were gone. It was yes. still the same thing of dealing with the people, dealing with the kids, dealing with families. That was the, the biggest difference. It was uh, families on this show. Uh, and it does kind of, it, it is kind of like a, a, a soft spot in my heart and, and a, a little sad that it isn't as popular as Nick Arcade because for me, it was, it was more fun. It honestly was more fun for me to do your on than it was Nick Arcade because by that time I knew what I, I could hit a mark. I knew where the cameras were. I could hear somebody talking in my ear and still 
keep my trend of thought. You know, I knew where to look. I knew I, by now I've gotten really used with improv and stuff. So just, you know, topping it, ad living with people was, was comfortable. And again, I wasn't scared of the process anymore. Being in front of the camera was no longer a for me. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was the best. Um, unfortunately it, the show was was wildly popular. It, it, its fate was really because of what was happening behind the scenes at Nickelodeon corporate mm-hmm. in general. As we all know, a couple of years later, Nickelodeon Studios Florida shut down. So they weren't really into investing large amounts of money into a, a IP uh, that was not going to have a place to live for more than two years. So right. like, you know, it was why throw millions of dollars into a show where, you know, it, we're shutting, the, we're moving, you know, you're not going to buy new furniture in your old house. You're going to wait to get to your new house to buy the new furniture. Right. That's kind of like where they were coming from. So. Oy. And, and I mean, when I see the pictures now, blue man group took over the old Nickelodeon studio space and it, it's just, it's just a shell of what it used to be because I, I you, you see the exterior of the building. It looks exactly like Nickelodeon Studios, but the marquee the shape the, of everything is there. Yeah, and, the, and, and the slime geyser is gone. Yeah, I the slime was, geyser. That, that was my favorite part. I've never been there, I, but of course, I've seen that many times. Yeah, I've never been. I haven't been back since it's gone. I've been back to Orlando uh, to do some work with Joey Fatone, but mm-hmm. um, I had not been back uh, to the studio, but I've seen those same pictures. Um, and yeah, it was, it was an amazing time, man, because even if you didn't get in to see a show that was being taped, you still got to experience it. Um, you know, one of the fun things we would do, they had a studio tour that would go, uh, like the, the stage floors down here while where we're shooting and then up, 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 way up in the rafters. Uh, they had a, a hallway that would go through this enclosed and soundproof glass and the studio tours would go by. So if a show was taping, you could be in the tour and look down and see the, the show taping. And yeah. every now and then I would hook up with a couple of my Nickelodeon fellow Nickelodeon, uh, uh, celebrities. And we would run up there and we blend in with the crowd, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> we're standing up there in the rafters while well, down there is where they shoot double there. And then I'm there with like, you know, uh, Danny Temporelli. We're going, I hear that show really stinks. And then they turn around and realize <laughs> it's us and go, eh. <laughs> you know, we, we, we would have fun like it was just an immersive experience whether or not you got to go to a taping or not you being a professional audience person imagine if you want to do a taping of a show and you couldn't get in but you could still go and immerse yourself in Nickelodeon and see the show taping that you couldn't get in you'd leave there an hour later after gone through this whole tour thing you would leave there having watched a few shows being taped seen some celebrities from mm-hmm. from the tour and and then maybe gotten slimed in a little area called game lab where you oh, could test yeah. out and play games too it was such a great idea and you know for whatever reason you know corporately decisions were made far above our pay grade Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's gone. Um, but man, what a unique whole situation that was Nick studios, Florida. Oh my God. And, and, and I mean, I'd love to see it again. I'd love to have, you know, a, a new Nick studios. You, you, yeah. you, you hear that uh, people out there in the <laughs> internet land, <laughs> well, we put a hashtag on top of the screen, bring <laughs> Nick studios back. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was a place that, uh, to me was very special in my heart. I mean, because mm-hmm. as I said before, you know, watching all these shows that I've seen growing up, you know, it's like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then realize, okay, this was done way before, you know, I was around <laughs> to actually do it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm back to reality. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're looking at, you're looking at guts going, I want to do guts. What? 1995 Ninja warrior. I can't do Ninja Warrior. No, no. <laughs> I need I need that bungee cord to help me. Yeah, I need that bungee cord, and I need I need uh I need that glowing piece. Wait, where I have I have a little piece. Uh, the, the, oh, you can't see it. You can't see it. It's green oh, screen. The cues out. <laughs> I'll put a picture of it in the in post. But but the, aggro means aggressive. That right there is not aggressive. That's mini crag. That's that's that that's, that's a mini crag. But <laughs> mini crag. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. I know what you're talking about. Anyway, um, I was trying. To, I'm looking. I'm not being rude. I'm trying to find a, a picture here that I want no, to show. No, yeah, you go for it. 
Uh, okay, uh, hang on. No, keep talking. Uh, yeah. just, you know, when I'm looking down, <laughs> I'm trying to find this picture because it's a really cool picture. And I'm going to find it for you. No, uh, I, while I, we're talking. <laughs> And, you know, we're going back to like you're on and everything. I remember at the mm-hmm. end of the show, there will always be some sort of uh, crazy stunt with the kids. They always involve mm-hmm. like slime or gross stuff. And I remember mm-hmm. a friend of mine showing you the last episode you taped. I think your son came on. You, yes. You, you, and the whole staff just like just started throwing pudding at you. Oh, slime my God. And, 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 and to hear my son tell the story, he said, even though he had a lot of fun, by the way, let me back up a little bit on my son, yeah. okay? Because my son, David, uh, he's also been seen on Nickelodeon more times than that. Right. Um, uh, there was an episode of All That in which uh, Milkman, there was Super oh, Dude God, and yes. Milkman, and Milkman had a shrinking rate that changed um, Super Dude into a little kid. <laughs> little Super Dude is my son, David. <laughs> uh, um, on an episode of Keenan and Kel, it was a two-parter called The Big Goodbye. It was mm-hmm. an episode where I think Keenan's family was supposed to be moving. And so he and Keenan are sitting there and they're finding their old toys from when they were little, when they first met. And then it kind of does a oh, flashback. flashback. Right. And my son played little Keenan. Uh, <laughs> also on figure it out. My son was a regular on the show. He was, he was actually working the show because he was one of the charade brigade. Kids oh yeah, that's that right. And did the little, the little Panama, <laughs> but, but, but on your on, um, the thing that he, the story that he tells was they took, since it was the last episode, all the stuff that they'd done during the entire season was still in the back. So they brought everything left over that wasn't used <laughs> and just gave it to him. And then my son has slimed me before. I mean, I mean, he's yeah. the son of a Nickelodeon person. Anybody, yeah, who's, a right a, of anybody who's a Nickelodeon person who, who's got a kid, it, the kid is going to eventually pie them slimed or whatever. Uh, and, and, but, but he got to just go like over the top with it. <laughs> they gave him so much stuff. It just kept coming. I was like, okay, are we going to call cut? No. Okay. <laughs> and of course, after a while, I couldn't see what was going on and I'm waiting for the director to go cut. And then you hear, no, we got another one. Oh, not another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh god my lord Man, i smelled like farting feet by the time i left put everything off oh, was, oh the smell was horrific that's one thing that 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 that, that, that uh, david actually says he goes after a while dad i felt like i was gagging because you smelled so bad <laughs> 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 God, oh. I mean, uh, when, when, I, when my friend Lee showed me that clip, I mean, I, I was like, dude. And of course, <laughs> you know, it's a TV show, so it's been edited down. Of course. Time. In real life, it kept coming and kept coming <laughs> and kept coming and kept coming. And kept, I mean, it, was, it was just, it would never, ever, ever stop. Stop, man. It was just, oh, oh my gosh. Just like the earth took a dump on me. It was so. <laughs> I mean, they had to dispose of it somehow. Oh my gosh. And, and like I said, after a while, the mixing of the different things created such a putrid stench that, 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 uh, there's a point where and David said, yeah, they wanted me to go on, but I kind of looked over at the executive producer who, you know, we, we knew, you know, we, 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 he, he, like I said, he grew up, not a Nick kid. He grew up mm-hmm. almost like corporate Nick in it. And yes. he just looked over and he just kind of looked like, nah, mm, mm. <laughs> 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 just, just so bad. Speaking of, this is a picture. I found a picture I wanted to show you. Yeah, when, sure. um, when they, when they did, when they did the uh, reboot of Double Dare, uh, yes. David and I went out to, to 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 support Mark and 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 and, and Liza. Who, my son, my son works in the business now, so he'd done a shoot with Liza before. And of course, okay. you know, we grew. He's grown up with quote unquote Uncle Mark, and so <laughs> I found this picture that I had back in the day, and I put these two together. I don't know if you can see it. This is oh us, nineteen ninety three, on the set of the original Double Dare in Orlando, and then the set of on the set of. Uh, the, the reboot in 2018. Wow. Man, that's just like really cool. <laughs> it's really come full circle at this point, 25 years later. Life, but, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're not done with uh, with you just yet. 
We'll come Uh-oh. back. Well, yeah, we're coming back next week with Mr. Phil Moore. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Hearst Show. Uh, next time, we'll we'll speak with uh, Mr. Phil Moore about how he ended up becoming uh, behind the camera, behind the scenes, because oh. this is something this is something that I do for a living as well. Mm. Uh, so we'll see you next time, Mr. Phil Moore, and for all of you all watching right. and for all you watching and listening, we'll see you next week. <laughs>